I want to look at some of the parables of Jesus today regarding the kingdom of God. Jesus was always speaking about the kingdom of God, about his father, about the plan of God for eternity. Matthew 25. We're going to read the parable of the ten virgins, as is commonly called. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. It's from Matthew 25, 1-13. This is a very important passage, I believe, speaking to us, the church, I personally believe, and I think the scripture will bear this up, that all of these ten maidens or virgins, depending on the translation, they were all Christians. They were all followers, or had all confessed Christ at some point in their lives. They were churchgoers. They were waiting to meet him. So the five foolish ones weren't the world. They weren't those outside the church, because they're, they're not waiting for the bridegroom to return. They're not waiting for the Lord to, to come back. But us in the church are waiting. And I think the, the problem here was there was a delay. I mean, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Well, that was almost 2,000 years ago. The Lord is waiting for us on some regard. If we look in Hebrews, it says that he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. And I believe that's because he's waiting for Christians to repent. He's waiting for us to make him our Lord. Not just call him our Lord, but actually have him be the Lord of our lives. So he's waiting for us, and we're waiting for him. While we're human, we get uh, bored sometimes waiting for things. We're in, especially the world we live in today, as an instant oatmeal and, and uh, microwave dinners and, and uh, instant coffee, fast food. We want things now. We don't like to wait. And I know that it says in Peter, not to think of his delay, that he's not coming. I think the scoffers, it says in the end times, will say, where is the promise of his coming? For things have continued since they were since the beginning of, of, of time. But it says that he's delayed. He is waiting because he desires that none would perish. So he's made himself real to some of us on the earth that he has called. But what do we do in the meantime? When we first get saved, quote-unquote saved, we're usually excited. We have now find we have a purpose in life. We have hope. We have um, something real to grab hold of. And we usually let go of some sins. We turn from some things, maybe make some new friends, start going to church. But then after 5, 10, 20 years... Nothing major has happened, and we're still waiting. And the world, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches begin to creep in and choke out the word that has come. And I believe the word is the lamp. It chokes out that so that we bear no fruit. If you look in the scripture, and I like Psalm 119, uh, 105, it says, The word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So this lamp that these ten, all ten of them had, I believe, was the Word of God. It was the Scripture, the Bible. They had some knowledge of it. They had Bibles. And they may have been reading them even. But five of them had the anointing. They kept themselves refreshed. I believe the anointing 
refer, the oil refers to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we have the Holy Spirit active in our lives, the Spirit reveals the truth of the Word of God to us. It keeps it alive within us, and we're growing and coming to maturity. But if the cares of life, deceitfulness of riches, the, the delay, the waiting, um, overtakes us, we lose that anointing. We lose that oil. The scripture says in Acts that the Father gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And it says in Luke that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, the Father will give him to us. I believe we can run out. I believe, and we see this in this, in this parable here of Jesus, it's a warning to us, the church, that we can run out of the oil. We can run out of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we're not walking in obedience, if we're not asking the Father, if we get distracted by other things, politics, money, um, other religions, whatever, things, uh, social causes, we can get caught up in all kinds of stuff we see in the world today. Just uh, I haven't had TV or news in my house for almost 20 years now. Because I don't, I, it's a distraction. I don't watch the news. I'll check things occasionally on the, on the internet, important things that are, that are taking place. But there's no TV running in my house all the time. I don't have cable television since I've moved up to Hemet and even before that. Those things are distractions. I want to remain in the Word of God. I want to remain in the Scripture. I know an old pastor used to say all the time that um, if you want to know the news, turn off the TV. At 11 o'clock, read your Bible. God will tell you what's going on, and I believe that. Um, and as we ask, the Holy Spirit will reveal the things to us that we need to know. And he may tell us to watch the news or, or, or um, gain understanding of something that's going on if he wants us to be a part of that or if it affects us or our family or the direction that he's guiding us into. But I don't want to be saturated with all the nonsense that's out there in the quote-unquote entertainment world. Um, no, we don't need that. We need to be full of the Spirit who is the one that teaches us what the Word of God means. So these, these five of them were wise, and they kept themselves in the anointing. They kept the oil in their lamps. So when they opened up their Bibles, which they opened up every day, the Lord could speak to them, tell them what He required of them, tell them that He loved them, I believe the Lord tells us when we read his word. He'll speak to our hearts as individuals to comfort us. The Holy Spirit's called the comforter in some cases. He's also our teacher. He guides us into all the truth and brings to remembrance the things that Jesus taught. So we need the Holy Spirit active in our lives. The Spirit is the one who gives the gifts. They're called the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. And all these things are to bring us into the image of Jesus Christ. So these other ones ran out. And as we see with Adam and Eve, and we see in Ephesians and Colossians, and it talks about the church being the counterpart for Christ, the wife of the Lamb. We need to be partaking of Him daily. We need to be being transformed to His image. Because when the bridegroom returns, He's not returning for a saved church he's coming for a transformed church who is like him because we have been made we've been partaking of his substance give us this day our daily bread and we are now in his image that's who he's coming back for and these others who had claimed his name and when they went out to buy not sure where they went to buy it from but uh, i think the implication was they, they had run out, and they, they were going to go seeking, trying to find it from someplace. But they needed to be in touch with the Lord continually. From the time he revealed himself through his word, gave us the opportunity to follow Jesus. So these others came, and the door was shut in their face. And these are Christians. Some of our modern doctrines have gotten us so far off, we don't even see that these things apply to us. The eternal security, once saved, always saved. That's not in the Bible. It doesn't even make any sense, honestly, if you think about it. If the Lord has saved us, He saved us to something. He saved us from bondage to sin in the world. But if we 
continually look back to the world and we continually refuse to let go of our sins, then the door will be shut in our face. We will not enter the inheritance just like Israel, most of Israel, did not enter into their inheritance because although they had been saved, they had the Spirit guiding them. Well, I'm doing a study on 1 Corinthians 10 now on the website and we're going to be getting into that if you want to follow along. Um, they had the things. They're a type that Paul uses of our Christian walk, our, our salvation. We were saved from the world. They had the anointing of the Spirit. They had the Spirit with them. They had Christ with them. In the desert is what the Word says. But they failed to enter into their inheritance because they kept looking back to the world and they kept um, refusing to let go of their sins. They didn't repent. So they were destroyed. And the door was shut in their face. They were not allowed to enter into the land. And we will not be allowed to enter into our inheritance in God's kingdom if we do not continually keep ourselves full of the Holy Spirit by walking in obedience, by asking the Father, and by seeking His face. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. An example of the oil, and I found this in uh, 1 Samuel 16, uh, 13. When God told Samuel to go anoint David as king, he had already established Saul as king. And he told Saul that if he would obey him, he would establish his throne forever. And I believe that this is, a, this is true. God's not going to make a promise in the Bible knowing that we're going to fail. I know that's taught. God gave the commandments because he knew we couldn't keep them. That's nonsense. I do not believe that. that, that that's a um, cruel God who tells us to do something knowing that we can't do it. That's, you're not going to find that in the scripture. So when God told Saul that he would have established his throne forever, he would have established his throne forever if Saul would have walked in obedience. But he didn't. He fell. He did some things. We're not going to get into all, this, all the um, things he did. But at that point, um, the Lord appeared to Samuel, the prophet, and told him, I have chosen David. And he wanted him to, to go anoint him. So it says in uh, 1 Samuel 16, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. The oil being poured upon him was the Spirit of the Lord coming. So that's, what I, that's why I say when we look in, in Matthew 25 here, that the oil that comes upon us as we read the Word is the Spirit who, who reveals the truth of the Scriptures to us. And it's interesting, because the next verse now in Samuel, after the anointing came upon David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. It said, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. <laughs> That's very interesting. So this tells us that Saul originally had the Spirit of the Lord upon him when he was anointed. But what did he do? He did not obey the Spirit of the Lord. He walked in disobedience. So the Spirit left him. And it went to another. It went to David. We see that many times in the Scripture when the Lord gave opportunity, like he did to Esther. And he gave her opportunity to be the one who would save the Jewish people from Haman's wicked plans. And he said, he said, if, if, if maybe you've been, uh, uh, what do you say, you come into the kingdom for such a time as this. He said, but if you don't, the deliverance will come through another. So God's deliverance, God's purpose is always going to prevail. It's, are we the individual that he has chosen? Are we going to allow that to happen through us? Are we going to be partakers and partners with him in that? Or are we going to forfeit that and it will go to another? So Saul had been anointed king. Saul had been given a promise. He had everything that David originally had also, but he forfeited it because of his disobedience. Now, yes, we know David had his problems, but he always repented. He came back. When Saul, Saul made excuses. Saul blamed other people for his shortcomings. When David was confronted by Nathan, he confessed. He broke down. He recognized he had sinned against the Lord, and he repented. 
he did suffer for that. He lost a child. He, he, he died way earlier than most of the other kings did. He was not allowed to build the temple. But he was still a man after God's own heart because he repented. He turned. He confessed his sins to the Lord. He did not try to make excuses for them. And this is true for us. All these are examples for us. Are we keeping ourselves full of the Holy Spirit? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to anoint us and reveal the truth to us, lift the veil from our eyes, so that we read the scripture, the, 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 the lamp that, is, that God has given to us, that we can understand the things that he is speaking to us as individuals and his plan of purpose for creation and for his church? Oh, Father. Oh, Father, help us, Lord, to remain saturated with the oil oil of gladness. Think about that. That's in the Psalms. It's in Hebrews also. Speaking of the Lord, speaking of the man, Jesus Christ, said he was anointed above his fellow companions with the oil because he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. He hated iniquity. That oil will come upon us if we're walking in righteousness, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we can receive of that oil, the same oil that anointed Jesus Christ as king, as Lord and Savior, will anoint us. Does not the word tell us that the elect of God are kings and priests and saviors, deliverers? Oh, Father. Father. Lord, help us to know your truth. Friends, I just want to encourage us today. I'm going to keep this short. I want to look at the other parables in Matthew 25 coming up in a couple more videos. I could probably go on for three hours here. Oh, God. But I just, I've, just in the things we've looked at briefly this morning, the oil, the lamp, I'm, I'm betting everybody watching this video right now we have the word. We have the lamp. We have the lamp. Do we have the oil? Do we have the anointing of the Spirit to lift the veil from our eyes, to show us what God is speaking to us as individuals? Are we hearing? Do we have ears to hear what he's saying? We need to hear. We need to heed the things that he is speaking to us. He says at the end of Matthew uh, 25, 30, Watch, therefore, for we don't know the hour of the day. We could graph charts and try to figure out when the Lord's coming. I have my own ideas, but I don't dwell on that because I need to be ready whether he's coming tomorrow, I'm sorry, whether he's coming today or next year or a thousand years from now, whether he comes to me as an individual or whether he comes to appear to the entire creation. We need to be ready. We cannot slack one day. It, it's, I'm saying this and I know it's true. And I struggle with things myself sometimes, and I know that we have times when we, when we go into a, a dark season or whatever, a famine of hearing the word of the Lord, but we press on. We may not feel like reading our scripture each day. We may not feel like praying or fellowshipping. Uh, we may neglect meeting with the saints, but we do it anyway. We press on anyway. We have to lay hold of eternal life. It is a fight. Fight the good fight of faith, Paul says. Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not a given. If the Lord has chosen us and he has unsaved us and anointed us and given of his, of his word and put his light within us, that is not a guarantee that we're going to enter into our inheritance. May we not find the door shut in our face in that day when he comes because we've neglected so great a salvation, because we've shrunk back from our salvation and we've turned back to the things of the world and we've not denied ourselves and we had our hand on the plow and we turned back. Men, these verses are in the scripture as warnings for us. May we heed them and may we recognize the wondrous joy that we can be partakers of if we keep the anointing of the Spirit upon us. And I believe we'll see greater things. The Lord said, because he goes to the Father and the Spirit comes, he said, greater things that we shall do because he goes to the Father. 
because he sent a spirit into our lives. May we not doubt the things that the word has said. There are some walking out there in the full power of the spirit today. I know there are those around the country and around the world that are, that are healing the sick. We're bringing life. I want to bring life to people by the things that I say, by the actions that I do. I want to bring hope to those around me. And I pray that that would be each one of our desires. Because the Lord is looking down. What are we doing with the anointing that he's given us? Are we letting it run out so that we're emptied? Or are we filling up so it spills out to others as we remain full? Out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water if we partake of that water. May we be partaking of the bread of life, receiving of his spirit each and every day. Blessings upon you and your house.